Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And good to see so many people turning up uh, in the room. And we've also got participants online. My name is uh, Rob Raven. I'll be chairing today's uh, seminar. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from where I'm speaking, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And um, today's events, we've got two events today, are part of the MSDI research seminar series. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about that, you can go to our website and there are um, all sorts of events that you can watch back from the past. There's even one uh, from today's speaker uh, that you can find there as well. Um, so for today's uh, seminar, we've partnered with ClimateWorks Center, uh, where we are uh, right now. Uh, and also with, uh, we've received support from the Monash Energy Institute. Um, so two events today. Uh, there's another event starting at four uh, till five with uh, Angie Wiener. Um, and hopefully she will arrive in time. She just, uh, plane has just landed, I was informed. So it seems to be going all well. Um, but first I'm very excited to have um, uh, Professor Benjamin Savakol uh, here joining us. And, um, uh, Benjamin is a professor at Boston University of uh, Earth and Environment, and he's also a professor at uh, Sussex University at SPRU uh, of Energy Policy. And I think you still have a connection uh, with Aarhus University as well. Uh, so very, very busy, uh, busy man. Uh, you cover many different types of, uh, of aspects in your re research, but all uh, related to energy and energy policy, energy justice, energy transitions. And um, for the researchers amongst us, many of you might also know Benjamin as the editor of um, Energy Research and Social Science, um, as well as the many, many uh, uh, highly influential publications uh, he tends to produce every, every year. Um, so uh, today, Benjamin will, will be sharing insights uh, from the, the Gini project, which is an EU uh, funded project that studies um, geoengineering and negative emission pathways in Europe. Before I hand over to you, uh, Benjamin, just some practicalities. Uh, the session uh, will uh, take about an hour. Uh, then uh, Benjamin will speak for about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, and then there will be a room for uh, questions and Q&A. And I will do my best to moderate uh, the, the Q&A. And Domi here behind the desk is also uh, taking um, and uh, keeping an eye on what's happening online. And we'll invite questions from our online participants into the conversation as well. Um, after the session has ended, uh, there's going to be a 30 minute break with some afternoon uh, tea. Feel free to hang around, have a chat and join us for the second uh, session as well. Benjamin, over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And this is kind of a nice presentation because it's a project that we're still in the middle of. So oftentimes we give presentations of work past that you can't change anymore. But today's research, you can actually shape. It's mutable, it's iterative, and we're only a third of the way through the project. And so um, it is, as Rob said, the Genie project. There's our lovely logo in different colors. So I could make it green, right, to match my shirt today, but also purple or blue. And it does stand for geoengineering and negative emissions pathways in Europe. And there's a very intentional connection to genies as well, because most of you know, there's the whole genie in the bottle, it grants you your wishes, but could also come at extreme peril and cost. And a lot of these technologies are so radical. There is a concern that we might be having more costs than benefits. And there's also a concern that once it's out of the bottle, it may not be able to be put back into the bottle. And that was all intentional and came in to how we named the project Genie. I'm also quite delighted we have a sister project that we just got funded last year from the Sloan Foundation, which is Genie US. And of course, that is now the Genius Project. <laughs> so we're having some fun with acronyms. Um, Genie is an ERC synergy grant. No one should really ever go for a synergy grant because there's like a 1% success rate. Synergy grants are meant to be big, so it's 10 million euros. They're meant to be radical, so you have to solve a social challenge like climate change or immigration. And finally, the two other things that are really hard, you have to put together a proposal that no one else will fund. So you shouldn't do it because if you don't win it, there's nowhere else you can go with it. And in this particular case, we were really lucky in that we actually had letters of where we had sent an earlier version of the proposal to the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK. And they said, too interdisciplinary, try the EPSRC. 
which is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. We sent it to EPSRC, and guess what their letter said? Why don't you try the ESRC? And so we were able to show the ERC, no one's going to fund this because it's at the interstitches between the disciplines. The final thing a synergy grant has to do is it has to take types of scientists who don't normally work together. And in this case, I realize we're probably lacking diversity of gender and diversity of sexuality. I think we all identify as white heterosexual men, but at least we do have diversity of hair. And so we have Greg's red hair and brown hair and gray hair, and I have no hair, as I like to tell Rob. But more seriously, I think the reason the project was funded is it takes qualitative social science, including justice and ethics, meets integrated assessment modeling and engineering, meets quantitative evidence synthesis, meets innovation policy and historical case studies. So we were quite able to bridge those disciplines, engineering, economics, machine learning, quantification, and quality and mixed methods qualitative research in ways that I guess they found compelling enough. So at least we have diversity in that sense of methods and disciplines, even if we're lacking diversity of gender. Why do we need research on negative emissions and geoengineering? And by the way, that generally is what the word geoengineering means. It's kind of two separate types of technology. Carbon removal or carbon dioxide removal or greenhouse gas removal, or if you want to sound cool, CDR. Or solar geoengineering or solar radiation management, or you can call it SRM. The reason that we need both approaches, well, arguably, carbon dioxide removal has to start to hit because our emissions pathways need to go net negative. So this is really challenging. Not only do we need to achieve climate mitigation and complete zero carbon economies, we then have to repair. We have to go net negative to kind of remove carbon from the atmosphere if we're going to undo the damage. Uh, we're already going to probably miss a 1.5 degree world. I was a lead author on the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, you probably missed that there's an 80% probability of a temperature change of two to three degrees. 2.7 degrees is the median scenario. So that's a very different world, twice as bad as perhaps a 1.5 degree change world. So there's kind of this assumption that come mid-century, we've got to be close to zero, and then we have to go net negative for the rest of the century and then the rest of the future. So these technologies could be here longer than Stonehenge, longer than we've practiced agriculture, longer than the Catholic Church has existed. We may need these technologies for thousands and thousands of years which is why you see all these terms being thrown around. Um, geoengineering often refers to both greenhouse gas removal and solar radiation management. They deal with carbon sinks in various ways, but they're fundamentally different than the other two pathways, which form the backbone of climate policy, which is mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation, adaptation. The IPCC report is even structured that way. Working group one, climate science. Working group two, adaptation. And three, mitigation. But these are fundamentally different because they're kind of presuming, well, if we don't mitigate in time, and if we haven't invested that much in adaptation, and we're not, what do we do? So they're kind of like plan C, plan D pathways, or break the glass emergency options is a term that is sometimes used. This shows you how the technologies span these different dichotomies that we use, right? Some of them are very much nature-based, natural, afforestation, soil carbon sequestration, uh, biochar, ecosystem adaptation, efforts they're doing to save the Great Barrier Reef would fall into geoengineering because you're trying to do ecosystem recovery, repair reefs from crown of thorns, starfish outbreaks from uh, heat strokes, from bleaching events, and from tsunamis. Right? All of that fits into what people sometimes call geoengineering. And then you have a whole set of like engineered ones. This is BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or direct air capture DAC, uh, which is great. This literally takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and pumps it below ground where you can store it. And then you also have some that are very much embedded in mineral supply chains. Here in Australia, they're piloting both of these, enhanced weathering and ocean alkalinization. Enhanced weathering puts things like basalt onto cropland that accelerates the natural process of storing carbon that basalt can store carbon for a thousand years and you can sprinkle it onto crops. And there's plantations that are actually doing this sugarcane uh, in North of Australia. 
as well as ocean alkalinization, which helps put lime and other things into the ocean to help undo the acidification that climate change is causing. Um, there's even some options that are so far out, they're extraterrestrial, like the intergovernmental or interplanetary sun shield, which is being pursued by NASA, Airbus Space and Defense, Boeing, Raytheon, OHB, which makes integrated spacecraft in Germany. Um, and this shows you plans, we published a paper on it, where you could put a shield at the Lagrange point between the earth and the sun. It's only the size of Texas, Rob. It's not that big. And it would only cost you about a trillion dollars. And you could use it to artificially dim the sun to then lower temperature here on earth. So you could arrest a one or two degree change by turning on the sunshade. And this shows you in our review, there's actually like dozens of proposals for these things that go back 50 years. Uh, my research fellow, Chad Baum, was even interviewed last week by the Washington Post because someone talked about detonating asteroids to create space dust, which would also lower the sunlight at the Lagrange point. So these things are being discussed and they become quite cool. Check this out. Here is the interplanetary sun shields space economy where we have Alpha Centauri sailing missions, where we have asteroid mining, moon bases, right? Where we can launch gigasail production. Uh, we can even do sailing missions to Mars, space trucks, robots, right? It's science fiction come alive. And here are some of the quotes. We did expert interviews with people at NASA and elsewise. Well, it's a plan B airbag solution, just there in case you need it, push the button. It's not meant to stay there more than just 10 or 20 years and then we can remove it. So it's a stopgap measure to fight climate change. Um, and there's a good examples from the Netherlands. It's like the Dutch dikes in space, right? We've done these mega projects before, we could do it again. You know. And there's this dictum for those that doubt, well, basically anything big enough to be interesting is big enough to be oppressive. So you know, don't worry about it too much. Um, and they talk about how you know, global investment in net zero infrastructure, IEA, International Energy Agency is saying $100 trillion needs invested in net zero by 2050. So that's a lot of money. This just costs $1 trillion. So it's one one hundredth the cost of having to invest in net zero infrastructure. So there are cases to be made for some of these more radical options. Um, closer here to Earth, there's also, like I said, direct air capture. And one of the nice things about the Genie project is we have a lot of money for field research. And so we're able to travel around the world visiting these places. This shows you carbon engineering's direct air capture facility in Canada, uh, where they literally take CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it. And this shows you the largest direct air capture facility in Iceland called Orca, named after the whale, uh, which does work. And it is powered by geothermal energy. There's a geothermal power plant over here. Um, and then it takes the CO2 here and then trucks it over to a reservoir in Iceland where it's stored safely underground. The good news that a facility like this is probably about as big as this floor of the building. So we're not talking massive. This was only $30 million. So it's like, you know, Elon Musk or others can afford to build it. The bad news is that this stores 4,000 tons of CO2 a year. It's not a lot. That's like by flight here, probably emitted close to that, if you account for everyone on board. Um, whereas we're at 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalent emitted every year. So like, it's just a small, small, small fraction. And this is the biggest direct air capture facility in the world right now. They're working on scaling it up. Um, but the technologies do exist and they are literally able to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, even though they have energy consumption needs. So. In Genie, we study all of this. We study 10 of these different carbon removal options, including DAC and enhanced weathering, and 10 of these solar radiation management ones, including sunshades and space-based mirrors and reflectors, alongside more mundane things like um, spraying aerosols into clouds or restoring ecosystems or blue carbon, things like kelp and seagrass and seaweed. We have an in-depth focus on 10 because 20 is just a lot. And this visualizes the kind of three different classes of those 10, whether it is stratospheric aerosol injection, 
marine cloud brightening, which they're also doing over the Great Barrier Reef, or space-based geoengineering. These are the kind of very three solar radiation management things. They control temperature and radiation from the sun. This shows you the more nature-based carbon removal options, forestry, soils, and oceans. And then this shows you the more engineered carbon removal options, which are DAC, BEX, enhanced weathering, and then biochar, which is kind of like a soil amendment like charcoal, somewhat similarly, that you can also use and couple to agricultural systems. And my poor research fellows drew these themselves. So each little diagram is meant to show you how it kind of works differently. And you can see all the different ways in which the arrows are storing carbon or in which we're reflecting sunlight back into space to help cool temperature. And I just wanted to focus, so the project's in its second year, and we've only been collecting data for about a year. So I only wanna focus on four findings so far that have emerged before I conclude. And the first finding is that what are called the co-benefits or the possible co-impacts of deployment are actually quite large. So it isn't just about climate. It's also about jobs, and resilience, and food security. And we did, like I said, 200, uh, 125 expert interviews and identified 107 different co-impacts that are analytically distinct across very different dimensions, political and geopolitical, environmental and social, economic and financial, or technical, including innovation and patents and things like that. Um, there is a split in that people tend to see more benefits than costs with carbon removal and more costs than benefits with solar radiation management. So you can see here, I think I probably should have put more labels on the graph, um, but this should be carbon removal. So more benefits than costs, and this is solar radiation management, more negative impacts than positive ones. But the colors are good because they also illustrate that the co-benefits span dimensions. It's not just technical. They're very economic and social and political. We also were pushed by an annoying peer reviewer to make this diagram, which doesn't really work, but hey, they made us do it, where we try to talk about intentional versus unintentional, as well as positive versus negative co-impacts. And again, not all of them are planned. And also not all of them um, are actually positive. You could have very negative ones. Like for instance, once we start to deploy solar radiation management, there's a real risk of termination shock, right? We have to do it forever. It's like holding a gun to your head. And if we stop doing it, uh, humanity could see climate change even faster than it would have without the intervention. At the same time, deployment of things like carbon removal could actually spur an entire new innovation network that's committed to circular economies and to you know, creating carbon obligations that help us accelerate our climate commitments. And then Sean Lowe, another one of my talented postdocs, did a nice comparative case assessment of 21 early stage experiments in these radical climate interventions. And you can see ocean iron fertilization, marine cloud brightening, aerosol injection, um, as well as ice protection, where you actually try to protect glaciers. And we have a nice article where we talk about themes of opposition, who's opposing these, what tactics do they use, as well as counter opposition networks that emerge in support of the technologies. Um, and what's interesting is that some of them, like ocean iron fertilization are kaput. No one is talking about it anymore. Like they've lost that struggle. And others like aerosol injection are in the middle of a huge controversy. Uh, they tried to deploy a balloon full of sulfur dioxide in Sweden called Scopex. And it was opposed by the Sami population and environmental groups. And they had to cancel the experiment. So there was this huge outcry about global north elite researchers from Harvard trying to use Sami lands in Sweden as an experimental site with balloons. And that's the other thing. Right now, balloons are also a bit controversial. And so no one wants to see a balloon flying above them, releasing particles. This helps show you some of the inductive themes that emerged from our 21 case studies. OF is ocean fertilization. MCB is marine cloud brightening. SAI is aerosol injection, EW is enhanced weathering. And again, you know, we kind of talked about the different oppositional strategies led by NGOs, the kind of strategies that counter the NGOs. And one of the conclusions is that camouflage, people who are able to reframe the intervention in different words, it's not ocean iron fertilization, it's salmon restoration. It's not uh, marine cloud brightening, it's coral reef protection. 
if you rename it and camouflage what it is, it tends to be more socially acceptable. So second finding is also very interesting. Within our 125 interviews, uh, 78 people took a survey at the end where we had a kind of survey instrument where they had to rank preference their different options. So it's kind of a form of expert elicitation. 74 experts participated with 800 years of experience. Wow, right? How do you argue with that? Um, with a huge bias towards people at universities, but at least some input from civil society, government, and the private sector. And again, when we asked these experts, and these experts knew their stuff, they've either developed patents on the technology or published multiple scientific outputs. So they're the Rob Ravens um, of negative emissions and geoengineering. We asked them, how many of you think that negative emissions and carbon removal are absolutely necessary to reach a carbon target? Look at that. 93% said yes. That's almost consensus. And then we similarly asked, what about solar radiation management? And it's almost the opposite. Two-thirds said no. We don't think we should be using it. So you can start to see a bit of a taboo and a split in our experts. They're for one type and against the other. We then asked them how desirable the options were, and this rates them on a, a scale of one to 10. So the higher the number, the more rated, positively rated they were. So our experts really like the nature-based ones, the engineered ones are okay, and they don't really like the ocean-based ones with an extreme dislike actually of ocean fertilization or ocean alkalinization, injecting chemicals into the ocean. And this shows you similarly in terms of solar radiation management, what they liked and didn't like various types of managing albedo on land, like painting roofs white, right? Or making crops uh, more resistant, um, all the way to things like the sunshades and the space-based reflectors are seen as not very desirable for these experts. We then asked how much they might cost by 2050, like what would we need to set a price on carbon to have these technologies work? And again, um, you can see that the range is quite significant for direct air capture, we need to have prices of 100 to 500 per ton, which just may never happen, right? There's no way I could see that happening um, by maybe mid-century, whereas others are less than 50 and some are actually close to zero or net negative because they create positive co-benefits like soil sequestration. We then asked um, for carbon removal options, it's always emissions displaced, but for the solar radiation management, it's temperature reduced, different metric. And so we thought, in 2050, how effectively do you think these options will be used? And the answer was that they expect albedo management and aerosols to both be operating to reduce temperature by about one degree. So that's pretty widespread deployment, um, if you believe our experts. And then we asked, it was a long survey, and then we asked questions, what year do you think the technology will be commercialized? Which is also fascinating. Uh, and I believe the Dots are outliers, they're box and whisker plots. So you look to the middle of the box for the mean. You can just see the X. So things like carbon capture utilization and storage are 2035, ecosystem restoration is 2032, space-based reflectors are 2088, right? So you can start to see very different timeframes being put forth by when they think some of these technologies will scale. And many people put never. <laughs> Because this captures only the mean. This gives you how often, and actually experts just put zero or said never. And again, you can see space-based and reflectors are almost never. Same with the ocean ones, as well as even some of the ones like aerosols and, and cloud brightening. We then asked in the final part about risk, and we had composite risk, like how risky do you think the technologies are? Just whatever you mean by risk. So our experts could self-define risk. And again, very Unsurprisingly, aerosol injection, space-based reflectors, and sunshades, and ocean stuff seen as risky. Um, others, like direct air capture or ecosystem restoration, or up here, afforestation and soils are seen as less risky. And we probably knew that already, but now we've confirmed it with our expert elicitation. And then we asked as our last question about barriers drawn from a literature review. So barriers could be difficulty in upscaling, difficulty in storing carbon, lack of social acceptance, lack of regulation, challenges with integrating systems, financing, market demand, risks to planetary health, and then of course other. Um, and it's meant now to 
be like a traffic light system. So the more red you see, the more barriers there are. The more green you see, the more green you are. And this is fascinating because first of all, it does imply that even the nature-based options have a lot of yellow. So even there's potentially opposition and risks uh, among different dimensions. Um, it certainly shows you that these options have a lot of red. And it also shows you that many of the barriers are what Rob would call socio-technical. It's not just about the technology, it's stuff like financing or risks to the environment or lack of social acceptance or things like regulation and law. Um, yeah. And then we have, so what does the expert survey mean? So the first thing is if you do a lot of expert elicitation, usually there's an optimism bias. We found the opposite. <laughs> like if you do it about nuclear power or desalination or hydrogen, they tend to love it. In this particular case, our results were like really critical. The experts were really cautious. If you look at how they rated different options together, the nature-based ones seem pretty good. A lot of the engineered ones seem less desirable. Um, yeah, and you could also add up in terms of technical potential. Some options have lots of potential like forestry, others like biochar are seen as having much less potential. You can then start to do with that diagram about cost per ton, comparative assessments. And this is kind of interesting, right? Like you can compare them. Soil carbon management, according to our experts, is 60 times better than BEX. So why don't we just do soil carbon management and forget BEX? Or ecosystem restoration is 18 times more efficacious than CCS. And blue carbon in oceans are 35 times more cost-effective than direct air capture. So it does imply that some of the options that are capturing a lot of attention, like DAC and BEX, aren't actually the most effective at displacing climate change. Um, and then in terms of timing, it was there in the graph, but I'll say it again. Only afforestation and soil carbon sequestration will be commercialized by 2035. Let me restate that. IPCC says we've got seven to eight years to fight climate change. If that's true, these are the only two options in the whole portfolio that we could deploy in time. All the others are like intellectual hypothesizing. It doesn't matter because come 2035, we will have had to have already started to fight climate change, right? So all these other options come too late, past 2040 or 2050 or 2070. They are unavailable for deployment in the next two decades which is a very sobering finding that of course, a lot of the advocates hate. <laughs> and then that underscores the other part about all those people who said never, <laughs> never will, reach, will they reach commercialization. So the third finding is interesting. And this was a throwaway term used about 10 years ago in an article that has become widely used and it's called a risk risk trade-off. It's not a typo. A risk risk trade-off is where you address one risk only by creating another risk. So you never eliminate risk. It'd be like, oh, Rob is driving drunk. There's a risk. So he decides to shoot heroin because he wants to wake himself up. That's a risk risk nexus. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And you see a lot of these risk-risk dimensions and that for every single possible benefit that these options have, there's also a really, really sobering risk. For instance, you could deploy stratospheric aerosol injection in a national program in three years. So we could literally be reducing temperature over Southeast Asia or Australia for heat waves in three years. That's a benefit. At the same time, it increases acid rain exposure. That's a risk. Um, by the year 2080, some of these systems like direct air capture could consume 80% of the world's energy supply, 80%. That's a huge risk. At the same time, the climate would be stable. That's a huge benefit. So again, we start to really see these wicked risk-risk trade-offs. And in this article, based on the interviews, we used a multidimensional notion of path dependence across institutions, technologies, and behavior, and identified 12 different risk-risk trade-offs within deployment options. I'll just give you one example. A lot of the literature talks about if we were to not be so centralized, if we were to do climate protection measures in a decentralized way, people 
planting gardens, you know, social movements deploying balloons full of aerosols. It's very democratic and very decentralized, which makes it cheaper and more scalable. That is one potential pathway of deployment. But the more that you distribute the technology, the more it could be used as a weapon, because you can weaponize these technologies to modify the weather. So there's a direct tension of distribution of the technology only unleashes the fertility for militarization and weaponization and use by terrorists. Or I love this term that came from our respondents, green finger rather than gold finger, green finger, someone who's trying to save the environment and they decide to deploy on their own without governance or oversight, just like the villains do in James Bond. And what's also kind of sad is a lot of these risk risk trade-offs cascade in mutually constitutive ways where it operates as a complex adaptive system and too much research only focuses on one piece of the system and misses all the complex interactions that could happen across the system. And it also means that it's all connected, right? This is kind of the big STS thing. You open the black box and it's infinitely seamless. Um, so that innovation and behavior and policy and modeling all coalesce together, um, which is very bad because it means that risks are compounded rather than just existing in isolation. Now my last finding is about justice. So in this particular piece, also based on our expert interviews, we're up now to all 125 with 881 years of experience um, and at least 10% participation of Global South researchers where we actually look at equity and justice. And so this actually shows you our interview guide where we had these seven themes and naturally, I'm only talking about this one. So if you want to read about actors, I talked about risks already, or coupling or innovation, those are published in other places. But we asked questions like this. What equity and justice concerns arise? What vulnerable groups are affected? And what risks do they entail for local communities? And we did a literature review that found that there wasn't that much discussion of justice. A lot of it was around procedural justice, just talking about lack of engagement in policymaking fora. There were some people using this term mitigation deterrence, which is just, we don't think we need to mitigate if we have these options as an airbag or plan B. And there was a little bit of talk about unfair distribution of risks and benefits. So we really wanted to contribute a different justice perspective that offered a whole systems lens all the way from the minerals and resources we extract to make the technologies, who works in the factories to assemble them, uh, how are they transported and constructed, how fair is our planning and policy making, how are they used, and what about waste streams? And we created this lovely diagram um, that shows you the whole system's justice impacts that are all negative. Whether we rely on a whole new chemicals industry, to help provide inputs for things like enhanced weathering, uh, or whether we now need massive fertilizers to help do afforestation and bioenergy plantations, where we see a concentration of ownership among Murdoch and Musk and others, or uh, where we actually see dispossession and sacrifice zones and land grabbing right around the global south. We displace smallholder farmers to help build you know, monocultures of carbon storage trees or whether we actually see the risk of termination shocks or intensified energy use, because a lot of these options like biochar or direct air capture need a lot of energy in order to function, as well as a whole uh, issue about waste and carbon storage. We even had respondents talking about how future terrorists could go after carbon reservoirs, right? And threaten to release 10 years worth of carbon unless they pay them 10 billion Bitcoin or some scenario like that. And I just want to focus on one, just to give you a sense for our qualitative data um, that help reveal some of these challenges. So here's one. For carbon removal to reach the scale required, we will need very super continental scale plantations. And this would need catchment areas of thousands of square kilometers. We had another respondent say it's about the size of India. That's how much land we need if we're going to actually be building and growing a lot of these options, right? Um, oh, and then, of course, we could throw in some drones, <laughs> uh, but that might be impossible. Or here, there won't be any trust for deployment of options in tribal lands, right? Do you really think the Navajo Nation or the First Nations communities in Canada or the traditional owners here in Australia will trust 
we're here from the government. We're just going to sprinkle some stuff in your clouds. No, they probably won't. Or what about tribal communities that think nature is sacred and spiritual and not to be intervened with? And there's other people who talk about how the people who will benefit are the same incumbents, oil and gas operators and engineers who've already benefited from destroying the planet. Um, and it could even justify continued use of fossil fuels, because if we can just safely stabilize the climate, we can emit whatever we want. There's a moral license to emit. And this just shows you at the end of the paper, you know, all of the stuff that came out of our qualitative data across the whole systems framework. And one of the conclusions is it isn't just the evil engineered stuff. It's also a lot of the nature-based stuff that also has monocultures and pesticides and resource curse risks for rural communities and competition with other land uses and poor monitoring and verification and even the generation of their own forms of waste. And we uh, had, were pushed by the peer reviewers to do this energy systems justice milieu, which tried to capture from below and from above perspectives together across different scales and temporalities. You know, uh, this is the geography literature for you from the micro politics of class contention all the way up to patterns of structural colonialism that shape different dimensions of justice well beyond what we saw in the literature, which was just about distribution and procedure. It's also about responsibility. It's about capabilities. It's about recognition. As you can see, yeah, here. So to conclude, I think, yes, I am almost out of time. That's what we've done in the first two years with a great team and a lot of really good data collection, uh, including people in Australia. I think four of our respondents were from Australia. What are we doing next? So one complication with most research is that it's one technology at one point in time. We're gonna study enhanced weathering in Queensland. We're gonna study biochar in Tennessee. We're gonna look at aerosol injection in Sweden. When in reality, most deployment will look like this. It'll actually be multiple options deployed by multiple actors with very poor governance all at once, which are called cocktails, right? And whether it's a cocktail like a gin and tonic that soothes the climate or a cocktail like a Molotov cocktail that blows up in our faces remains to be seen. And how these portfolios interact can be very complicated. And I'll give you just one example. The interplanetary sun shield that I said could dim the sun by like 3% and lower temperature by about two degrees would also interfere with all of the solar energy production we have on the planet because you've now changed solar radiance and the distribution of photons to the earth's atmosphere so our beautiful sunshade has now stopped one of our best mitigation options by lowering its efficiency so we're really concerned about multiple wicked trade-offs trade-offs within carbon dioxide removal deployment pathways where a lot of these options, right, could compete, like you have a land, do you do soil management or BEX? You can't use it for both, which one do you choose? Or you could see trade-offs between carbon removal and geoengineering, or you could see trade-offs between these and mitigation or adaptation, or you could see trade-offs with these and the SDGs and poverty and hunger and security and jobs. So like the ability for risk-risk trade-offs now becomes you know, exponentially uh, intensified across these different portfolios. And our capability to understand these and model these is extremely nascent and perhaps even impossible. And the second thing we're doing is we're focusing on social acceptance and legitimacy. This shows you, by the way, the secret diagram that we had in our proposal for Genie, um, which shows you all six discrete work packages and the two transversal work packages. So eight work packages, 12 research questions, all in a single slide in color. Um, and here, you know, we are asking questions like, what's the public knowledge about these options? What do they deem as acceptable? What preferences do they have for deployment, small scale deployment or regional deployment? Um, and we also have a whole kind of co-creation it's part of the, of, of the grant that does knowledge workshops and training modelers and all of that. And, and we are literally in the middle right now of finishing a very intensive survey in 30 countries, including Australia, uh, with 31,000 respondents, which is really nice because we found in our own review that the US, the UK, and Germany account for 80% of the case study work on these options. 
So there's a huge need to go beyond just the global north. And so we intentionally did this survey to be a lot of European countries, but also Latin American countries, small island states like the Dominican Republic, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, you know, Singapore, um, to get a real nice global benchmark for attitudes. And then we coupled it with 44 focus groups, two in each country, one in an urban place, one in a rural place, uh, to get a really good global baseline. Um, and that survey instrument, I have to give a lot of credit to Chad and, and Sean, is, is really nice. I think I even, yeah, it, it talks about familiarity with the technology, risks and benefits, support or not, whether they want moratoriums or not, what policy options they like, covariates like if you have solar energy, how much are you more or less likely? If you identify as an ethnic minority, uh, if you've been affected by climate change, uh, if you're high income, if you're highly educated, we look at all of those important things, as well as what types of values people have, um, aversion to tampering with nature, extrinsic versus intrinsic, biospheric versus altruistic versus selfish, egoistic values. All of that uh, is really nicely in, in the survey. So we're going to get a very, very rich assessment about people's perceptions. And then the focus groups were structured similarly to mirror the survey in this part. So the stuff about risks and benefits and policies and governance is meant to triangulate the survey. But then we also had a fun part that was new, which was people's imagined futures, science fiction prototyping, um, asking them to think about headlines out to 2030 that they think would appear based on deployment. They all had to pick one technology. And I'm really happy that all of them have chosen a variety of technologies. Um, and the 44 focus groups have more than 300 participants. So we now have 300 imagined futures to analyze, which we're in the process of analyzing. So that's where we're going next with portfolios, social acceptance. And so watch this space and we'll certainly be able to share the data on Australia in a few months. Thanks, Rob. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. I think that was an extraordinary story and look into a future, whether that's a horrible future or a beautiful future. There's no, well, the answer to that I think is still to come, but um, I'm really happy to open up the floor for any questions uh, or comments that the talk might have triggered. And also looking at um, the online participants to either post questions in the chat or raise your digital finger and uh, we'll make sure you can ask the question yourself. So who wants to go first? Yeah, Annika. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was so interesting and so so nice to see that you got this funding for this <laughs> very interesting project and I'm very impressed by all the uh, data you've gathered. But uh, it went a little fast. So um, I just, and you said it sometimes, but I just wanted to see if you could say a little bit more on what, what was the most surprising, uh, what was the most surprising thing that you, got out of the particularly then the survey data. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, the preconceived ideas that you had and when you applied and, and maybe even from, from the reviews of literature. So I think so far to me, the most surprising finding from the project is the risk-risk trade-off. A lot of people thought these technologies will eliminate risk or at least will solve the climate risk when really it's just transferring risk in different ways from the climatic system to the land system, from the global north to the global south, from technology A to technology B. So I think this notion that risk is, is never reduced is really problematic because the whole point is to reduce risk. So I think overall, that's probably where we, we didn't know, right, what we were gonna find when we did a lot of these expert interviews. And so the fact that this is also coming from experts who are advocates for the technology, it's not like we just went to the critics. These are the people that are developing the technology and prototyping it and experimenting on it in labs. Um, and so it's kind of the fact that they're telling us these risks exist is, is quite troublesome. From this survey, there's a lot to go through. It's taken us three months just to analyze the data, and we just finished it two weeks ago. So it's very, very new and fresh. But there, we were quite surprised. There are colleagues, including Frank Bierman, who's at Utrecht University, who have called for a moratorium on these technologies, a treaty of non-use, especially for geoengineering. And they're doing it on the grounds that they say the global north should not exploit the global south. We shouldn't be imposing these technologies on India, China, Africa, et cetera. 
And one of our findings from the survey is actually the global south is the most favorable for these deployment. The global south countries so far, with some exceptions, are more open to experimenting with it, to doing outdoor experiments with it, to doing policy support, to doing widespread deployment, and to also see in the co-benefits like developing the aerospace industry and the chemicals industry and the agricultural industry. So to hear it from the global south, they want it more than the global north. So it really seems to challenge a lot of thinking that we should restrict these technologies. So when you say the global south is the one that's accepting, who in the global south? Because you also gave that example from the Sami people. They're kind of the south within the north. So I'm assuming it's a particular type of actor within the global south. Wow. In this particular case, it's Publix, the na a nationally representative sample of the public. So it's going to have, you know, it's, we're not oversampling people from the Sami or people from different indigenous groups. But I will say that, you know, we took a lot of care. That survey was done in 18 languages. So it's local languages. We had both information treatments where we, we ex exposed every participant to some information about the technologies. And if they failed that step, they were kicked out of the survey. We also had three retention checks in the middle of the survey to make sure they're paying attention. If they filled that, they're out of the survey. If they straight line the survey, they were out. And also we uh, had a few other things that they put in the survey design. You could take it on your phone. You could also uh, resume it. So a lot of surveys you got to do in one go. This one, you were able to like start it before dinner, come back to it the next day. So all of that means that I think the responses are pretty genuine. They're pretty rigorous. And it was a nationally representative sample for the countries for age, gender, education, and location. So I think you can trust, you know, and by Global South too, it is Brazil, India, China, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Dominican Republic, and uh, Kenya, and, I, and I'm missing a few others, but it is like, it's those countries. It's not like Mexico, <laughs> which is kind of Global South-ish in North America, but not quite. So I think there at least we're able to say that uh, the ordinary public seems to support it more in the global south. Maybe just I, I was actually going to mention Frank Bierman, so you were ahead of me on that one. But I think there was another argument in, that he's making is that um, uh, these kind of technologies they're non-governable, so they're basically too too big, too complex, and there's a there's an there's an argument there that the global community will never be able to agree on how how to govern that so that the risks are reduced. Um, how do you see that in relation to your... I think he's, he's half right. There are certain forms of deployment that are very centralized, top-down, that could be done in very similar ways to nuclear power or big hydro, which have displaced you know, millions of communities and caused a lot of environmental damage. But that's not the only way we can deploy. And Sean Lowe, we had another paper that I didn't present, where he took Amory Lovin's Hard and Soft Paths so the hard path is like top-down, centralized, non-depletable um, or depletable that, you know, coal, baseload nuclear, these big technologies that we just push. And soft is like small scale, democratic, democratized, energy efficiency, decentralized, small is beautiful from the bottom up. And Sean did identify both pathways for this. So we do have the big hard paths, but we also have soft paths. We have paths that could be like community-based biochar that benefits women farmers in Tanzania. Or we have um, a campaign that could be like Greta Thunberg helping motivate her followers to spread aerosols via balloons, right? Small scale, small tech that we're all doing outside our neighborhoods and communities. And if you all read, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson has a book, Ministry of the Future. In that book, there's a thriving market for carbon gardens where every home stores carbon in their garden and they get a credit, right? Uh, to store it at their home. So I think those types of options are very different than what Frank is talking about. And some of those options, like painting roofs white, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Other than the paint, right? I mean, like, that's not going to harm anyone. And that's one of the biggest forms of geoengineering that we could do to reduce temperature. So I think um, Frank is half right about the hard, but not about the soft. Thanks, Benjamin. We've got a few questions online, I believe. So hand over to Domi. Uh, and unfortunately, with the way the Zoom's set up, you're just going to have to put up with my voice asking the questions. Um, but we do have our first one from Yuan Malika, and they're interested in the interviewed experts. So were those experts people who were involved in the development of these technologies, such as engineers and scientists, 
or did you also interview social scientists and policymakers? And following that, what role can social scientists actually play in this space? So it's a yes and a yes to the first part. Um, we did some of the people we interviewed were engineers. They were, you know, developing prototypes. They were lab people who published patents on it. Um, and some were policymakers. We interviewed people, I can't tell you who, Department of Energy uh, at Bayes, which is Department of Energy in the UK, at the Swedish Space Agency and others. So, you know, we do have a nice, and then some were social scientists as well, political economists, justice scholars. Um, I can't give you their names, but they're writing really good articles that are critical of the technology in addition to people we interviewed who were for it. So for our interview sampling, it was always people who were both we had some who were for, some who were against, so there's symmetry. And we also sought a critical stakeholder approach, which we didn't fully achieve. We wanted participants from academia, civil society, the private sector, and government. Um, so we at least tried to get all of those people. In terms of the role that social scientists play, um, I think they've been often marginalized up to this point. And I think it's just some of these things that you see here, innovation dynamics, risk, justice, that's social science, right? Social acceptance, that's us. So I think that, you know, we have a central role to play in uncovering. I mean, as Rob and others know, transitions are socio-technical. Sometimes the technology is the easiest part of a transition. It's all the other stuff, regulations, norms, behavior, policies, financial markets that are the real sticking point. So if that's the case, 20% of this is technical, 80% is social science. So I really believe that. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got another one from May Chu. Um, also asking about the uh, interviewed experts. To what extent do you think the results might have been different if the majority of your expert pool were practitioners, investors, technical players, rather than university academics? Yeah. I bet we would have seen more of the hype bias and more of the optimism bias. Uh, and there is a lot of money pouring into these things. And in fact, even geoengineering, if you want to see something really interesting, last month, a company called Making Sunsets tried to do another experiment in Mexico. And they're also talking about aerosols to actually modify the way that the sun looks. Um, and there's also an NGO called Silver Lining, which is a great title, right? Because it's the lining inside the cloud that's against these types of deployment. So. My guess would be that the, inventor, the investors and the venture capitalists are a lot more positive. As a sign of this, there's been three or four really big funds launched by venture capital backing these options. And one of them is backed by Google, by sorry, Meta and Alphabet, which are the companies behind Facebook and Google for like $100 billion. Uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act has billions of dollars for DAC and BEX. Uh, and CCS. So I think in that regard, like they think it's great and they see a huge business opportunity. Um, so that's probably one way in which it would have changed. We've got, I think, at least three questions left in the room. So I'm going to uh, fall. I'm going to ask everyone to be very brief, ask your question, and you get to pick which one to answer at the end. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you can answer them all if you both. Okay, if I can be quick. Uh, yeah. John, you had a question, I think? Well, it was partly raising your last response, but I wondered what economic and commercial lens you put over this, the cost of, of the different measures and how that will impact on what happens. You okay remembering that one? Yeah. Cost. Or business models. Uh, ben, with the, um, uh, the transition that we're going through globally, do you have good examples around the world of transitions that are taking into account all those social sides. Yeah. I just was wondering what happens next based on all of the um, things that you've found. What, what do you think should be happening next to resolve this, um, the way forward? Thank you, Tal. And the last one? Sorry. This I don't is know four, Rob, this is four questions. <laughs> Hold on a second here. Wait. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ben, I just wanted to take you to your last dot point in the whole slides, I think, which was about imagined futures. And I realise it's a little early, but I wondered if there are any, you know, a couple of uh, patterns, if you like, emerging in terms of how people see what imagined futures in 2035 um, in terms of this debate. I can do all four quickly. 
there's a mix of positive and negative. That's the really surprising thing. It's like half the respondents have really positive, uplifting ones of where we've had climate repair, we're all living happily, and there are others who are like, it's terrorism, it's, just, it's devastation, and we've failed, and there's only a small pocket of humanity left with robots. You know, um, in terms of what's next, my partners are really, really well placed. K1 visits the UN General Assembly all the time and leads the community of modelers that do integrated assessment modeling. And so what we're trying to do is now revalidate their models to better take into effect a lot of these constraints, just so that they get a better picture of how much we can deploy. Because right now the assumption built into the models is just massive deployment by 2080. It's like, you know, 80, 90% emissions reductions are these technologies and they're not even proven yet. So I think it's just making them more realistic. Changing the modeling behavior will hopefully change policy behavior. I know your question was business models. What was yours? The examples of- Oh yeah, the yep. So that. not in these, cause these are so kind of new and we haven't even begun the transition for many of them, but we did do a nice article called how long will it take? That was about 10 rapid energy transitions that talked about how they occurred. Uh, and it's things like cook stoves in China and flex fuel vehicles in Brazil, uh, the Dutch dash for gas, French nuclear power, uh, combined heat and power in Denmark, where they got off of oil in three years after the oil embargo. Um, so stuff like that. So and the kind of lesson there is they were all multi-actor polycentric transitions that mixed top-down, bottom-up action together and had strong leaders as well. And then in terms of the business models, we do see a dichotomy in the work so far that suggests carbon dioxide removal options do have business models, like people expect a price for carbon of X, and that's how these things can deploy, right? Or they're getting benefits for some of the co-benefits, like you know jobs and resilience. Whereas solar radiation management is seen as there's no money to be made. It's just a public good, and it will have to be the military or government. So I think that's the kind of dichotomy we see so far from the data. All right, thank you very much, Benjamin. Really great talk, very good to have you here. And uh, thank you all for coming and please uh, hang around for another 30 minutes and we'll have another talk behind you.